Would you please join me as we take our Bibles together this morning? Find the Gospel of John, if you would please. John chapter 13 is where we are this morning. Turn there with me. Again, if you don't happen to have your Bible, please feel free to use the one there next to the hymn books. Let's all look at uh, the Word of the Lord together today. John chapter 13. Our subject this morning is truth. We're going to be talking about truth today. Did you know that there's something about truth? Truth never changes. Did you know that? Truth is always the same. Now, truth can make you feel good, and sometimes truth can make you feel kind of bad. But truth never changes. John chapter 13, I was reading a story about a man who owned a pet duck. And one day, this man's duck died. He loved his duck. And he couldn't accept the truth that his pet was gone, so he decided he would take his duck to the animal hospital. And the vet looked at it and said, sir, this bird's dead. And the man said, he just can't be. He can't be. Isn't there something else, some other test that you can do? And so the vet brought in his pet Labrador retriever, and the dog looked at the, <laughs> the duck and sniffed on the duck and kind of looked up at the vet and shook his head and walked out of the room. And the man brought in his pet cat, and the cat jumped up on the table, walked up one side of the duck and down the other, and meowed and laid down. He was kind of sad. And the vet said, sir, I'm sorry to tell you, but your duck is definitely dead. And then he left the room. He started typing on his computer, went out and came right back with a piece of paper, and he handed the paper to the man. The man said, what's this? And the vet said, well, this is your bill. And the man looked at the bill, the piece of paper, and he said, this is, bill is for $1,500. He told me that... You're going to charge me $1,500 to tell me that my duck is dead? And the vet said, well, if you had believed what I told you at first, it would have cost you $20. But the CAT scan and the lab report are extra. <laughs> let, me ask you, let me ask you, how many times... <laughs> you can tell that story again over lunch today, okay? <laughs> How many times has somebody told you something and said it was the truth, but you didn't believe it? Has it ever happened to you? Somebody told you the truth, or said they told you something, said it was the truth, but you didn't believe it. You know, it happens all the time. In fact, it happened a lot between Jesus and his disciples. You know, Jesus would tell his disciples, this is getting ready to happen, or I'm getting ready to do this, and his disciples wouldn't believe him. Now, why? You would think that if Jesus would tell you something, you'd believe it. Why didn't they believe him? Well, let me ask you this. How come we don't believe? Why is it that when Jesus tells us something, or he tells us to do something, or he tells us he wants to do this, how come we don't believe? When we read in the Bible where Jesus has told us he promised to do this, or he promised he's going to do that, why don't we believe? So really, we're no different, are we? We're no different than those disciples. Well, on the night before Jesus' crucifixion, he faced three truths. We're going to look at those this morning. These, these three truths that Jesus faced were troubling truths. Not, not that Jesus didn't believe it. He knew that. They were troubling because he knew what these truths meant. And he knew what these truths held for him. So let's look at them together, okay? I want you to notice the first truth in verse 18, the first truth concerning his betrayal. The first truth, troubling truth, concerning Christ's betrayal. John chapter 13, verse 18. Jesus said, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I've chosen but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. In, in the previous passage, we read how Jesus washed his disciples' feet. Do you remember that? We talked about that last week. Jesus gave his disciples a new command as he did that. He said, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You should do as I have done unto you. So you should do that to one another. 
You know, greatness in the world today is based upon, from the world's perspective, how much a person owns, or how much power a person possesses, or how many people a person leads. That's how the world judges greatness today. But greatness in Jesus' kingdom is not based on any of that. Greatness in Jesus' kingdom is judged by how many people you serve. How many people you serve? How many people are you serving in your sphere of influence today? How many are you serving? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, Whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you must first become your slave. Greatness in Jesus' kingdom, and from Jesus' perspective, is exactly opposite of what the world sees and thinks. Jesus told his disciples uh, another remarkable thing. In verse 10, he told his disciples, He who is bathed only needs to wash his feet, but he's completely clean. And then he went on to say, But not all of you are clean. Number one, we noticed from that that salvation is available to everybody. Salvation is available to whosoever, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord. We noticed that Jesus even washed Judas' feet. Did you catch that? Judas was part of that group, but not everybody was saved in that group, and not everybody will be saved. Not everybody will believe. Judas didn't believe. But notice also Jesus was showing us that once you're saved, you're completely clean. Or in other words, once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're saved, you're forever saved. You're completely saved. But even though you're saved from sin, Jesus said you're not kept from sin. You know, even though we're saved from sin, the truth is that we will still sin. John writes to us in 1 John chapter 2, when we sin, we have an advocate between us and the Father, the Lord Jesus. And we're given a promise in 1 John chapter 1 that if we confess our sins, what happens? He is faithful and just and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Now, why would God give us that promise? He gave us that promise because we're going to sin. And if you've not sinned already today, you will. But I suspect that you're probably like me. It's already happened. And we need to continually confess our sin so that we can be cleansed. And that's what Jesus told his disciples. He said that when you sin, all you need to do is wash your feet. Or in other words, all you need to do is you need to confess your sin and then allow God to cleanse you with his forgiveness. He's not saying that you're saved again, but that you're restored again. That's what happens. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're saved, it's like taking a bath, you're clean. But when you sin, you need to wash your hands. You need to wash your feet. And Jesus has said he would do that if we confess our sins to him. Jesus said another remarkable thing. We just read it in verse 18. Look at that again. Notice he said, I do not speak concerning all of you. What Jesus just said to his disciples didn't apply to all of his disciples. One of, his, one of uh, Jesus' disciples wasn't saved. We know it was Judas. Judas had not believed. And that's remarkable. You know, when you think, well, if anybody should have believed, it should have been him and the others. I mean, they were with Jesus all the time. They heard him, they, they saw him, they lived with him, they, they walked with him. Everything that they saw and they heard, certainly he should have believed. Certainly he should have been saved, but he wasn't. Was Jesus surprised by that? Verse 18 tells us he wasn't surprised at all. He knew exactly. Jesus knew it. He declared it. And he said that it had to be that way because the Scripture said it had to be that way. You see, Jesus knew God's Word because Jesus is the Word. And Jesus kept the Word. Notice in verse 18, Jesus quotes the Word. He said, he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. 
That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? We, we would say it like this today. We would say, my best friend kicked me when I was down. Has that ever happened to you? You ever been down and you expected your friend to come along and lift you up and instead he just stepped on you? Has that ever happened to you? It happened to Jesus. So if it ever happens to you, you're in good company. My friend has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus is quoting words from Psalm 41, which happened a thousand some years earlier. It happened to King David. You, you see, David had his own traitor. He, he had a friend, a man whose name was Ahithophel. And Ahithophel was one of David's closest friends. He was one of David's advisors. And Ahithophel had consistently counseled David and given him good advice. And at some point or another, he became a little upset with the king. Actually, he became a lot upset with the king. He became so disgruntled with David that he decided to turn his back on him. He, he decided that he would go over to the other side. He, he changed allegiance. He, he sided with, of all people, David's own son, a man named Absalom. When David was the most vulnerable, when he was down, when he was the most open, Ahithophel kicked him, stepped on him. What happened to David a thousand years before happens to Jesus. And Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling us that what happened to David was just a, a prophecy of what was going to happen to the Son of Man, to Jesus. You see, Jesus had his own traitor. His name wasn't Ahithophel. His, his name was Judas. And, and yes, Judas had been one of the original 12 disciples. Uh, he'd been one of Jesus' most close and trusted friends. In fact, all of the disciples trusted Judas. They gave him the money box. So you can tell that he was highly regarded by the disciples. He was entrusted by the Lord. And none of the disciples ever sensed that Judas was getting ready to betray Jesus. They would have never guessed that. But Jesus knew. Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. Frightening, isn't it? Think about the, the secret that you think nobody else knows. You've worked so hard to keep it just, between, just to you. Jesus knows that. And if that doesn't scare you, let me tell you this. Jesus knows things about you that you don't know. That ought to really scare us. Verse 19, Jesus goes on now. He says, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, verse 20, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. I think over his ministry, Jesus performed countless miracles. I mean, the Bible is full of them. At the end of John's gospel, he says, We've, I've only written down here just a teeny piece of what Jesus did. In fact, it was said back then that Jesus had basically wiped out all sickness from that part of the world. He'd done so many miracles. He had healed so many people. He had cast out so many demons that there was virtually nobody who was sick. Everybody who lived back then either saw a miracle that Jesus performed or they knew somebody who had seen a miracle. That's how many miracles Jesus had done in his ministry. He did those miracles as a demonstration of his power to prove that, yes, he is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. But on numerous occasions, Jesus also demonstrated his omniscience, that he knows everything. You recall back in Matthew chapter 9, there were some men who brought their friend to Jesus. Their friend was paralyzed. Do you remember that story? He had been bedridden virtually all his life, and his friends felt so sorry for him that they thought, if we can just get him to Jesus, Jesus will heal him. You remember they, they carried him on his bed. They couldn't get into the house, so they took him up on the roof, and they dug a hole through the roof and let him down in front of the Lord so his friend, their friend could be healed. Jesus said to the man, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, you're healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. 
And you remember what the religious leaders did? Oh, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, they began to say to themselves, began thinking about this, this man is a blasphemer. That's what they were thinking. And then Jesus said to them, knowing their thoughts, the scripture says, why do you think evil in your heart? Why do you think evil in your heart? Hold on, we didn't even say what we were thinking. And Jesus knew that. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus casts out a, a demon from a man who had been possessed for a long, long time. And the religious leaders said to themselves, this man casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Frightening, isn't it? Jesus knows our thoughts. Notice that Jesus shares about his betrayal with his disciples for one purpose. We see it there in verse 19. He says, I tell you before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe in me, so that you may believe that I am he. So every miracle, every word, every sermon, every prophecy, everything that Jesus did, they were, all of those things were designed to strengthen the disciples' faith, to solidify their belief in him as the Messiah. Now, why did they need to have their strength, their faith, their faith strengthened? Well, why do we need to have our faith strengthened? Because there's times in our lives that come about when we don't believe. There's times that come about in our lives where we struggle with believing because we forget. And, and Jesus knew this was going to happen to the disciples. Jesus knew that his disciples would need this kind of strong faith because he was getting ready to send them on a mission. Now, they were going to go on a worldwide mission to share the gospel with everybody. There was going to be some times where People were going to say, hip, hip, hooray, I want the Lord Jesus. And then there were going to be a lot of times where they were going to say, get out of here. I'm not interested in what you have to say. There would be a lot of times when they would slam, the, the door would be slammed in their face. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever shared Jesus with somebody and they told you no? Or they got angry? That They became very mad with you for sharing about Jesus being the Messiah? Jesus knew that that would happen to his disciples, and he knew that when it happened, they were going to need strong faith to be able to share. They were going to need to know that Jesus is the Messiah. And folks, that truth is the same today. Jesus is still the Messiah. Did you know that? Jesus is still the Savior. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? We should rejoice in that today. You know, verse 20, what we just read here, frees us up to share our message about Jesus. Verse 20 says, Whoever receives whomever I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So what's our job, folks? Our job is simply to share. Share what you know. And you don't have to know everything to share. Share what you know. Your job is not to save people. Jesus saves. We don't save. We share. Make sure that you, you never get those things mixed up. Your responsibility is to share and then leave the results up to God. Your, your responsibility is not to see that person to get saved. You're just supposed to tell them, here's what the Lord's done for me. And he can do that for you too, if you would just trust him. But Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, how can people call on him if they don't hear? And how can they hear unless somebody goes? And how can people go unless they're sent? Would we be willing to go? Would we be willing to believe that, yes, God has sent us? He wants us to go. Would we be willing to share as we go? Would we be willing to do that? You know, the first truth that Jesus faced had to do with his betrayal. That was just a, a few hours in front of him. But notice in verse 21, the second truth. The second truth had to do with his burden. Follow along, verse 21, we read this. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit. And he testified and he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. You know, in verse 18, Jesus alludes to his betrayal. He who eats bread has lifted up his heel against me. He's kind of just, we would look at that and say he's beaten around the bush. But in verse 21, Jesus is no longer beaten around the bush. He comes right out and he clearly says, one of you, and that narrows it down to 12, one of you will betray me. But in verse 20, we see that Jesus, before he says this, he was troubled. You see it there? He was troubled in his spirit. The word troubled there means 
to be under severe mental anguish. So we would say troubled means, well, you just kind of sit around. This Jesus is far, he's, he's in much more distress than what we would think about in being troubled. This is the same word, troubled, that's used to describe some other events in the Bible. Did you know that when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were troubled? The Bible says that they were gripped with fear. That's the kind of trouble they had. When Zacharias in, uh, it was in the temple and he was ministering before the Lord and the angel Gabriel appeared to him, he was troubled. He was gripped with fear too. And when Jesus stood outside of Lazarus' tomb, weeping over the death of his friend, Jesus was troubled. Not with fear, but over grief. And this is the kind of, these are the kind of emotions that Jesus was dealing with. This is what he was facing. Now, the question would be, well, why was he troubled? Why was he troubled? Well, obviously, one answer would be he was troubled because the cross was near. You know, the cross was just a few hours away. Jesus was troubled by that. He was disturbed by the, the pain that he knew he would experience. He was disturbed by, by the rejection that he would experience. Jesus was, I think, even more disturbed by the sin he would bear. He knew that. You see, Jesus was perfect. He'd never sinned. He was without sin. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might be in Christ the righteousness of God. Let those words sink into you. We're sinners. Christ came and gave his life so that we could be holy just like he is. Isn't that remarkable? That's amazing. Jesus would bear the weight of our sin as he hung on the cross. Jesus would endure the wrath of God poured out against our sin as he hung on the cross. Jesus was troubled by that. We could see that, couldn't we? But consider this. Possibly Jesus was troubled by the betrayal that was getting ready to happen. See, one of his disciples was a traitor. One of his disciples, his closest friend, would betray him. And Jesus had been rejected before. You can read about that in the Bible. He'd been rejected. He'd been run out of town. He'd been told to get out of here. All of that had happened before, but he'd never been rejected like this. He was getting ready to experience something he'd never experienced before in his ministry. But thirdly, Jesus, I believe, was troubled because of what was getting ready to happen to Judas. Think about that for a little bit. Judas was about ready to step across the line. He was about ready to go beyond what we would call the point of no return. He was getting ready to take that step. G Judas was just about ready to use up his last chance. The last couple of weeks we've been talking about another chance. Judas is getting ready to use up his last chance. In less than a day, Jesus would be dead. Guess what? Judas is going to be dead too. In less than a day, Jesus' body would be in the tomb. Judas would be in hell. Je Jesus would be raised three days later. Judas is condemned. Jesus knew that. He was troubled by what was getting ready to happen to one of his disciples. And folks, that same fate awaits every person who rejects Christ. You reject Jesus, your destiny, your fate will be to meet Judas in hell. Every person who goes out of this life without Christ is destined for that kind of an end. Why is that? Well, you see, every person is born under the sentence of sin. Every person is born under a death sentence. All of us have sinned. And because of that, the wages of sin is death. We're all under a death sentence. But God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. The promise that if you will believe in him, he'll save you. And you won't perish, but rather you'll have eternal life. And that only takes place in this life. And it only takes place when you choose to trust Jesus. Well, let's let's um, do a little experiment this morning. Let me ask you, how many of you are saved today? You're saved this morning? Okay, I'd say most, if not all of us here, or say we're saved or born again. Let me ask you this.
How many of you were saved before you were 20? How many of you were saved before you were 20? A lot of hands. How many of you were saved between the ages of 20 and 50? A few, quite a few, wow. How many of you were saved older than 65? Wow. That shows us that you're more likely to receive Christ when you're younger than when you're older. And that's just a reality. I didn't make that up. The reality is that you're more likely to trust Jesus as your Savior as a younger person than as an older person. Now, why is that? Well, consider what happens as we age. As we age, God gives you opportunities to trust Jesus. He calls and he says, would you trust my son? And as you say, no, not right now, maybe later, now is not convenient. Every time the answer is something other than yes, your heart gets a little bit harder. And it gets harder and harder and harder. And your hearing goes weaker and weaker and weaker. Until you can't hear anymore. But you have one more chance. That's the beauty about right now. You know, the, the beauty about today, and the beauty about every day when you wake up, your eyes pop open, and you're able to climb out of bed, the beauty about that day is that you have an opportunity to know Jesus. But don't take that for granted. Because there's going to come a day when the sun will come up and your eyes won't pop open. And that's when you'll know, oop, that was my last chance. Don't wait until the last chance. Take this chance. Use this opportunity. Don't test God. Don't test Him with the thought that, well, I've got tomorrow. You don't know that. You don't know that you even have five minutes from now. But you have now. You know, the Bible says today, if you will hear His voice, don't harden your heart like your ancestors did at the waters of bitterness and rebellion. But rather, would you listen and would you say yes to the Lord this morning? Verse 22. The disciples looked about. Now remember, Jesus just said, one of you will betray me. The disciples are looking around at each other. And notice that they're perplexed about whom he spoke of. Verse 23, there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know that this was the Apostle John. And leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered and said, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. You know, when Jesus said there, one of you will betray me, that caught every one of them by surprise. Nobody was expecting that. They're probably looking at each other going, betrayed? What is he talking about here? And one of us, there's no way. There's no way that that could be. Eleven of the disciples were surprised that Jesus would say that. Did you know that there was one disciple who was surprised that Jesus would know that? <laughs> they all were surprised. Peter wants to know who it is so that he can go beat him up. <laughs> But Peter wasn't exactly sitting close, and so he, he looks over at John, and he goes, Hey, ask him, who is it? And so John does, Who is it, Lord? Who is it, Lord? And Jesus gave an answer. He told him exactly who it was. He says, It's the one I give this piece of bread to. Now, either John wasn't listening, Jesus was speaking too softly, or maybe the Holy Spirit just kind of kept him from understanding it. But notice that, Jesus hands this little piece of bread, he dips it, and gives it to Judas. Now, what's that all about? Well, see, it was customary back then that the host of a meal would save a piece of bread, and, and it was a real honor to get this piece of bread from the host. The host would dip this bread in vinegar and salt and, and crushed up fruits and vegetables, and, and it was a gesture of kindness. It was an honor to be given this piece of bread. Jesus offers this to his betrayer. Hmm. He offers this honor to Judas. Now, not as a, just as a way of revealing his betrayer, but I think that Jesus did this as one final call, one final chance, one last opportunity for Judas to repent, 
and to be restored, to repent and to be saved, to repent and trust Jesus. Now, Jesus already knew what Judas was going to do. He already knew that there's no way that Judas was going to believe because he'd already made up his mind. He'd already made his decision. Judas was too far gone. Why is that? Because his heart had grown too hard. He'd heard, but he couldn't hear. He had seen, but he was blind. He couldn't believe. He wouldn't believe. He refused to believe. Jesus was concerned about the truth of his betrayal and the truth of his, the burden he would bear. But notice in verse 27, he was also concerned, he was troubled by the truth about his betrayer. Uh, let's look at that. Verse 27, after the piece of bread, after Judas ate this piece of bread, Satan entered him. Wow. And Jesus said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason Jesus said this to him. Now, they, that means that they could hear what he was saying. They thought for, some thought that Judas, Judas had the money box and that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. And having received the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately and it was night. You know, Jesus calls Judas to repent. He gives him another opportunity to be saved. Notice what happens. Exactly the opposite happened. Judas, uh, Judas, instead of receiving Christ, he received Satan. Satan entered him. Boy, that's a scary thought, isn't it? He was possessed by Satan himself. Now, does that trouble you? Does that kind of bother you? Some would look at that and say, well, this couldn't be Judas' fault. I mean, Satan had a hold of him, so it had to be Satan's fault. But the answer is no, it was Judas's fault because he was responsible for his decision to reject Jesus. You see, when, Jesus, when Judas said no to Jesus, he was saying yes to Satan. And you can't have it both ways. You know, it's, it's one or the other. In fact, when it comes to your relationship with Jesus, there's no neutral ground. There's no Switzerland when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. I mean, you're either for him or you're against him. That's what the Bible says. You're, you're either his friend or you're his enemy. That's what the Bible says. Notice in verse 27, Jesus told Judas what you do, do quickly. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Now, Judas had been revealed as the betrayer. His plan had been exposed. And so if Judas was going to betray the Lord, he knew that he had to move quick before Everybody else heard about his plan before everybody else found out about this. And so notice that in verse 30, he went out. And it said that he went out immediately, and it was night. Judas had rejected Jesus for the last time. There would be no more second chances for him. There, there would be no more opportunities for him to be saved. But notice in verse 30, something interesting there. John describes for us the physical and the spiritual setting of that moment. Do you see it there? It was night. It was night. Physically, it was night. Physically, it was dark. The sun had set. The light had gone out. The sun was down. But also, spiritually, the light had gone out. The light had gone out of Judas. His heart was dark. He would never be able to see. Never be able to trust the Lord. You know, as I... Kind of peek out through the windows there. It looks like the sun's come out on this nice sunny day. I'm assuming we'll have a nice sunny day today. On this beautiful day the Lord's made. Did you know that many people are living in darkness? Did you know that? No, not in America. Yes, especially in America. Many people, thousands of people, I would say even millions of people are living in spiritual darkness today. Some don't know. Some have never heard about Jesus. In America? Yes. In America. There are people in our country who have never heard about Jesus. They've heard his name, but only in a swearing sense. But they've never heard that Jesus is a real person and that he's the Savior. They're living in spiritual darkness. But there are many who have heard, but yet they've said no. They've heard and... They've never trusted Christ. If you are here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus. You've never received Him as your Savior. You have never placed your faith in His shed blood, His death on the cross, His burial, His resurrection as 
what is sufficient for your salvation, your forgiveness of sins. If that's you, you're close, but you're not there. You're not saved. And when it comes to salvation, close is not good enough. You know, we would call close as being like, well, I know somebody who was saved. I know somebody who was religious. <laughs> I, I had a grandmother that went to church. I had a father who was a preacher. That's great. It's close. But close isn't good enough. Close won't get you into heaven. How do you get to heaven? The Bible simply says that if you will confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. Confess what? Jesus is Lord. Believe what? That God raised him from the dead. So to confess with your mouth is to say Jesus is Lord. He's my Lord. To believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead is to say that I have and serve and know a risen Savior. He's not dead. He's alive. Jesus is alive today. And he's here this morning. If that's you, if you've never trusted Christ, if you know you're not saved, it's not too late. God is giving you another chance. And I can't say that this is your last chance. I don't know that. It might be. Jesus might give you tomorrow, and he might give you another chance tomorrow. I don't know that. He might. But are you willing to take the risk of that? Are you willing to take a chance at that? There are many people in our land that take chances all the time. They go down and buy a lottery ticket thinking that they're going to win the big, the big drawing. But even above that, there are people every day that take a risk. They think, oh, I'll just wait till tomorrow. I've got things I want to do. I, I want to have fun. I'm too young. When, when I get older, I'm too busy. When I retire, I'm, I'll do that later. That's, just, that's worse than playing the lottery. Because you don't know. You don't know. The Bible says that we all have sinned. We all need a Savior. We all need a Savior because we're under the sentence of sin. God sent us a Savior. And Jesus demonstrated his love for you by going to the cross and dying there, by taking your place. And when he died there, when he shed his blood there, he paid the price. He paid our sin debt. And he paid it in full. But it only becomes yours when you trust him. Maybe you're thinking, it's too late for me. It's never too late. As long as you can breathe, it's not too late. Would you trust him this morning? Well, how does that happen? It happens like this. And there's nothing that's magic about it. It's, it's a heart thing. It's simply confessing to the Lord. And being honest with him. Lord, I'm a sinner. You said that and you're right. I'm a sinner. And I deserve death. Just like you said. But I know that you love me. You proved it. And I believe that when you went to the cross and you died there, that you paid my sin debt. What you did there was sufficient to save me. And you can save me. And you said that you will save me. And that's what I'm asking you to do this morning. And I'm believing that you can and you will. Would you save me today, Lord? Forgive me my sins. Come in and take control of my life. Make me different and help me to serve you for the rest of my life. And if that's the honest desire of your heart, the Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So do you know that you're saved? If not, you have this opportunity. Maybe you're saved, but maybe you've never followed Christ Maybe you've never made that decision known. Uh, maybe you've never joined a church and been part of a fellowship or a part of a ministry. And you're looking at your life and you remember back to that time when Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. I've got something amazing for you. And you said, I don't have time for that, Lord. Not right now. Maybe you're thinking, it's too late for me. It's not too late. It's not too late. You can confess Christ as your Savior this morning. You can follow him today. You can become part of his work. Would you do that? Every one of us has a decision to make this morning. Would you make yours for the Lord today? Pray with me, would you please? Every head bowed right now, every eye closed. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to each one of us. I know he's been speaking to me. What's he been saying to you? Has he shown something to you about yourself that maybe you didn't know? Has he shown you something that you particularly didn't want to see?
is he said something you didn't really want to hear. But nonetheless, it's the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. I am the life. And then Jesus said this, no one can come to the Father except through me. No one can get to heaven except by going through Jesus. And no one can be saved unless you trust Jesus. But Jesus is giving each one of us the opportunity, the chance to do that right now. If you're not saved, would you trust him this morning? Make that little prayer that I just shared with you yours. And just talk to the Lord about it. Trust him to do what he said he would do. But if you're saved and you've never followed him publicly, or you're saved and you're not walking with him, uh, you're saved but you're not serving him, today is the day of new beginnings. Would you make your decision for the Lord today? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And your word indeed, Lord, is alive and it's sharp. And I'm sure that your word has cut each one of us right down to the quick. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. So unless you would speak to us, Lord, we would never know. So thank you for using your word in that way today. But now that we know, Lord, we are without excuse. And none of us know if we have this afternoon, but we, we have the gift of right now. And as you have called, you're calling us to come just as we are. Not to go home and get things cleaned up or get things in order, but just to come right now and to allow you to do what only you can do. And that's to change us. So I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here today who's not saved, extend your grace, give faith that's needed to believe, and save lives this morning. And I pray, Lord, for all of your people here today, thanking you for saving us and now asking that you would transform us. Make us different. Help us right now, Father, to follow you, to believe and to trust you, and then to walk more closely with you each and every day. So help our decisions right now to be those which honor you. We pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen.